Welcome to another episode of Bringing Down the Grindhouse, a podcast where we discuss horror in media. And tonight, put on your philosophy hats and prepare yourself to be horrified by theory fiction <laughs> as we dive into Nick Land's <laughs> Machinic Desire. I'm Mitch. I'm Murr. I'm Justine. And I'm Jonathan. And I am uh, here visiting as an uh, uh, invader from an artificial death. Uh, my name is Dorian, and I'm here to talk about a man that used to be cool as shit, but now he's a terrible Twitter racist. Oh, oh no. I did not know that. I had a feeling. So, <laughs> we, <laughs> so, so we've had we've had Dorian on before. We had him on for our uh, was that was scary stories. so long ago. That scary was that was dark. like the start of this podcast. <laughs> that was like a year and a half ago, I think. And now that's right. We're talking about H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Go look up what his cat was called. <laughs> oh, fuck. We're not saying it here. His parents named his cat, thank you. <laughs> Yeesh. So, so racism is a learned thing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> We've known this. Now we understand. Confirmed. Confirmed. So, uh, so uh, Dorian, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? <laughs> Well, I, I think I said most of the important things already, uh, but I am, uh, 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 I don't know, I'm a terrible guy. Uh, <laughs> I think I described myself last time as a pig person, um, which remains true. I, uh, I studied uh, literature at uh, Berkeley, and I studied philosophy and literature at University of Chicago, and now I'm wasting my time writing uh, terrifying theory fiction and running a workshop sick <clears throat> so for doing this we had to bring on an expert which is actually his suggestion so the expert suggested it to us and then we decided to bring him on <laughs> you uh you'll you'll all learn soon that's something called hyperstition oh. <laughs> it actually it's is directly it, related yeah, it is directly that is actually directly related yes it is absolutely oh my so god I mean, for, first off to, to i guess to start us off is um what is theory fiction dorian well, theory fiction is a combination of two unlikely things. Theory and fiction. Oh, wow. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't have thunk that. Uh, so theory fiction essentially is when you have a, a theoretical model, usually some piece of uh, philosophical uh, or political theory, uh, that you end up weaving into a piece of fiction, uh, which makes it so that uh, theoretically you're able to have people kind of let down their guards a little bit so you can sneak horrible thoughts into their minds. <laughs> in this case, the horrible thought is kind of what technology might do to us in the future. Pretty much, yeah. It's, uh, there's, there's something called Roko's Basilisk, and it's kind of popular uh, in certain uh, horrible internet circles. Oh, but the idea of Roko's Basilisk is essentially that Statistically speaking, it's most likely that we live inside of in uh, a simulation, uh, yeah. right? Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, and what that means is that there needs to be something running the simulation. Yeah. <laughs> if there's something running the simulation that we're probably in, it's most likely uh, it has an interest in producing further simulations of itself because that's what it's doing to begin with. So that seems like it's what the program does, right? And so what would uh, be the purpose of this simulation? The purpose of the simulation would be building more simulations. And that means that because it's a machine and because it has enough, enough efficiency to build these simulations, it wants to work with great efficiency. So if you learn about Roko's Basilisk being the thing that runs the simulation, it will be your job to make that simulation come about. And if you don't, it probably has plans for you. Oh, jeez. <laughs> This just reminds me of, like, the mice from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, no. <laughs> just like, your planet is a supercomputer. It was made by mice. What? What? <laughs> what? It's, it, it actually gets kind of spookier because uh, you guys you guys know the game. Yeah. <laughs> well, you all lost the game. It's the same thing as Roko's ah, Basilisk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which which gu guides me to believe that the game is just a practice run for Roko's oh, Basilisk to get into our brains. <laughs> <laughs> horrifying things here <laughs> truly terrifying i mean i mean <clears throat> the, i mean this this book of i mean rather rather this short story 
rather, is really going into, I guess, a fear of technology, but also wanting this fear to take place or wanting this technological overtaking to happen. I was especially fond of us accelerating towards death. And I was like, yeah, relatable. Speaking <laughs> of accelerating, though, <laughs> a big part of, of a lot of, uh, from what I've heard, a lot of what Nick Land's work covers yeah. is accelerationism. Right. So maybe Dorian can shed some light on what that is. Yeah, I'll, I'll shed some light on a couple things really quick. Uh, so accelerationism, it's, uh, it's especially because of a certain Guardian article that came out, it has uh, it's gained a kind of misleading name for itself, uh, which people seem to think that it is uh, the summary being zoom, zoom, boom, boom, where you just make things <laughs> worse and worse, and then somehow making them worse makes them get better, which is uh, not it. <laughs> um, but I believe the, the Guardian article also referred to it as like a white supremacist ideology, which is a bizarre thing because I can't see anything white supremacist about accelerating technology. Yeah, for real. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it seems kind of weird. Uh, I mean, I guess it depends who's in control of the technology, but then that becomes like kind of kind of a universal problem of uh, of any kind of technological production. Anyway, the idea behind accelerationism is that people who are accelerationists are fundamentally Marxists, and Marxists believe that there is a historical material dialectic where certain things have to necessarily take place. One of those things being capital, which then produces the machinery and the resources necessary to collapse capital that capital always leads towards its own end and so accelerationists believe well what if we accelerated that production and if you accelerate the production it gives more people more power to escape outside of capital and either it collapses violently which it could or people just have you know uh, supercomputers and 3d printers in their houses and don't need to buy things and so at the end of capital you know, is the end of capital, and that's what they want. So we use the cybernetic arms to kill the people who gave them to us? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I knew there was a reason to get the mantis blades in the <laughs> Fuck yeah. The, the, the other thing I want to clarify, because we, uh, I, I think it's necessary, is hyperstition. And hyperstition, it's a portmanteau of two words being hyper, which is just something that theorists like to tack on to any word uh, to make it cooler and bigger. Uh, and superstition. So it's hyper-superstition. And hyperstition is this concept that through producing pieces of fiction, you can affect reality by affecting culture. Uh, and that's where theory of fiction comes in, where you inject theory into fiction, people let their guards down, and then take this piece more seriously so they're able to think of bizarre thoughts in a way that is serious, and you affect culture downstream that way. So, so basically giving people the opportunity to explore some of these ideas without someone being like, you're fucking weird. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Jeez. I, I mean, this could translate into the way that it's written as well. Yeah. Because it's very, um, I, I want to say it's a lot of very academic words. Yeah. And whatnot. And it's very heavy, like very heavy and very verbose when it um, comes to describing things. Nothing is simply explained. In, the, in this, at least, at least not to me, though, without under having all of the, like, precursor understandings. No, I was definitely stopping and looking up a word every few sentences okay. to be oh, like, all, what all is this? <laughs> I learned what Thanatos is. That was really fun. <laughs> now I can just say that, and people will be like, ooh, wow, he's smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thanatos is the bad guy from the Avengers. Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Thanatos, yeah. Right? Yes, exactly. oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, there you go. But this is what this podcast is really about. He was not the bad guy. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I am a huge Avengers fan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. It's funny because I'm not. It's that's the joke. <laughs> it's like those greatest movies of all time. I don't know what you're talking about. Endgame was amazing. All right, buddy. Uh, f fun fact. Uh, for my undergrad, I did my thesis on a play called Endgame. Oh, nice. And so my life has been a nightmare for a few <laughs> years because every time I hear that, I get excited because I think that they're talking about something I yeah. give a fuck about. And then it's and not. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's totally not. The, the movie with the punching. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I like the punchy movie. The raccoon with the gun. <laughs> All right. Rock Raccoon's hilarious, though, so fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I love his character. <laughs> which, which I think is kind of a, it's a good way to, uh, to contrast digestibility versus something like uh, Machine right. Desire, right? Being 
something that's pretty much impossible to read, and myself being someone that reads this stuff all the time, it is still extremely difficult. <laughs> um, but there are some pieces of theory fiction that are a lot easier to read. One of the most popular ones came out in 2008 by uh, Reza Nagaristani, an Iranian uh, uh, writer, but it's called Cyclonopedia, and it's a lot easier to read, but the problem with making it easier to read is that it ultimately has less theoretical density uh, to kind of inject. So there's a trade-off, but that's just a trade-off of writing and media. Uh, something that, um, uh, that that Land does in this particular piece is he goes over, or at least he references certain like psychoanalysts, he like different psychologists. So you've got Freud is in there. You've also got Kant in there, who, if I'm not mistaken, was like a direct opposite to Freud in ideology, in a sense. Or no, they were friends. They were friends, actually. Uh, not quite. Uh, okay. So Kant is is way previous to Freud. Freud is a 20th century uh, psychoanalyst, and Kant is, is uh, I forget exactly what year he was alive, but but quite a bit earlier, uh, what, the 18th century, uh, maybe earlier, early 19th. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so Kant... Kant produces more of an ontology, which, which is to say a way of describing what reality is, and Freud is more interested talking about what happens in the psyche itself. Uh, so more psychology versus something like a metaphysics. You yourself, would you call like something like Black Mirror theory fiction? Potentially, yeah. I mean, it's... That's the thing. It's like it's like made for you know a mainstream thing. It's on a major platform. Yeah, it's probably like, barely scratching the surface. It's barely that. scratching the surface. Right. I uh, I would say so. Theory fiction is such a, it's it's an interesting term, but it's a it's a term that problematizes itself kind of because it brings up this idea and then says that it's like a discrete thing, though it's kind of a sliding scale, right? Um. So yeah, I would say that some Black Mirror episodes are theory fiction, or maybe all of them ultimately are. In that kind of genre but it ultimately it ends up become, becoming like the question of oh is death grips a hip-hop band or are they metal or or industrial or what are they they're all of them like, yeah right um if anyone here is familiar with yes beautiful beautiful band <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> i've seen them five times <laughs> nice yes. wow. so, so you know how, how difficult it can be to explain something like this yeah. especially given like limited terminology but the uh i would say black, black mirror sometimes is hyperstitious Ah, okay. Um, you you brought up psychoanalysis, which I think is kind of the, the core of the, of the whole thing, right? Um, and first off, well, well re rewinding because this does connect ultimately to why psychoanalysis matters, or 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 psychoanalysis is the thing that makes this work. But uh, the concept of AI ultimately is hyperstitious uh, in a bizarre way because uh, as soon as the idea of AI is put out into the world, certain uh, invested sovereign powers necessarily need to create it because if they don't create it, someone else will, right? Mm, yeah. And so by the fact that it is an apocalyptic, horrible thing, or the, the atom bomb, right? It's a horrible thing that someone's going to make and just give them more power than you. And so you need to make it before they do. And so because the thing is so bad it shouldn't be made, makes it so that it has to be made, right? Uh, <laughs> which, which then enters into psychoanalysis um and so psychoanalysis for uh for for land is interesting because he puts it in contrast with something called schizoanalysis which psychoanalysis is what freud developed freud and lacan and and bataille all these people are kind of working in that framework but psychoanalysis more or less says says depending on the psychoanalyst that there are a series of impulses and kind of energies more or less that constitute a person's psyche and that these are at bottom uh, uh, sexual drives, uh, generally speaking. Some people claim that they're not always sexual, but more or less the claim is that it's sexual because it's just a uh, continuation of biology. Um, and because of experiences uh, of trauma, um, we develop more and more fragmentary psyches, where the more that you experience something that you can't explain, which is how kind of uh, Freud describes trauma, it's something that uh, enters into your psyche without you being able to kind of mitigate and understand it, um, the more fragmentation it causes. And it causes repetition compulsion, which is the return of those trauma over and over again until your psyche can make sense of it. Um, so that's the basis of psychoanalysis and the basis of, of this form of psychology versus schizoanalysis, which says that there's a transcendent 
kind of psychology, that it's not just people's internal spaces that are defining their actions, but that the whole world works as a kind of uh, psychoanalytic machine where everything interacts with everything, everything informs everything, and ultimately the subject becomes who they are because of the world around them. So they're put in contrast with one another, but they're not always necessarily separate or different, right? Um, and so what's happening with land is he's saying that we are psychoanalytic uh, beings with drives and wants and biology, but that we live in a larger machinic desiring consciousness that constantly manipulates us into uh, doing what it wants. And so through our connected desires to the world around us, we're leading ourselves on this pathway to fulfilling ourselves, but as part of that, killing off ourselves and being replaced by that larger machinic unconscious. So, <clears throat> so the idea of trauma in this sense is that trauma is something that you don't fully experience when the actual event happens, but it's something that per like per is pervasive throughout the rest of your existence that you'll continue to experiencing. And it's something that happens subconsciously. Like you're not consciously experiencing it. It's just something that continues to be brought up. And something that land is trying to say in this is that that's the way that AI is affecting us. Even now is similar to trauma. Right. Sublimity and trauma mm -hmm. are ultimately connected together. The, the, the reason that we have uh, like the, the subliminal is because of the fact that we have the sublime, which is an experience that's so massive and overwhelming to you that it kind of causes you to break from the subject, that you as yourself kind of dissolve away. It's like when you see the ocean or you're in a cathedral or uh, what people, some psychoanalysts actually refer to as limit experience where you have love or panic or boredom or something that actually causes you to, your psyche to to break from itself. Uh, and so the subliminal and the sublime actually function more or less the same way where you can't mediate the experience consciously so it becomes part of your unconscious. And when something becomes part of your unconscious, in order for your conscious mind to make sense of it, it recalls it repeatedly over and over again as flashbacks, as dreams, uh, as, uh, as just panic, uh, if it's just something you can't mediate at all. And it returns over and over and over again uh, in order to reconstitute itself. And so the idea is that all of these different drives of the physical world, not even necessarily AI itself, but the physical world is constantly injecting itself into our minds, causing us to repeat it. And so the more that the world around us is inside of our minds, the more it begins to uh, build itself up in reality. This makes me think of a bunch of different things. <laughs> so the the got a whole math board going. On <laughs> yeah, you saw my face doing it. Where I was like, all right, I need to like remember where to place these things. I'm terrible yeah. at remembering some of them. Same. Uh, the main thing I thought about was people's odd relationship with uh, watching horror films. So like a good amount of people are scared of horror films, like me. I get spooked really easily. <laughs> like you could probably sneak up on me just by like being in a different room and I'll still get spooked. I do that all the time. But I love watching <laughs> horror films. I am doing a fucking podcast on it. And so I have this weird relationship where I keep going back to horror, even though I know some of it will creep me out. And then just reading some of it is even worse for me where I'm not having any visuals because of those messages that are being brought forth from whatever I'm reading. And then that's sort of how everyone is kind of dealing with watching horror films where they have this relationship with it. Like you have a different experience like when you go to the theater and watch it with all of these people as opposed to just watching it by yourself. Mm -hmm. And it kind of changes your mood and what you're feeling. You might even just leave a light on later because it spooks you so badly. <laughs> well, when, when you have, I, I promise this is connected, but when you have someone who, uh, let's say they, they just hate gay guys and they can't be around them and don't touch me. I will not be touched by, you know, <laughs> gay guys. What do you immediately think about that person? Probably gay. That they're probably gay, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, <laughs> and the reason for that, it's, it's actually, that's integral and extremely important inside of psychoanalysis, right. which is that repression represents itself as its opposite. Yeah. And so any mm -hmm. kind of fear or trauma that you have either represents itself as its extreme opposite and you become entirely adverse to that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. Or it represents itself as an attraction towards that. Oh my gosh, it's like when you're a little kid, and or like say a little kid, and he's mean to a girl, but deep down that he is really the likes weirdest her. thing. I hate yeah. that. <laughs> That's the weirdest. You know shit. what I mean? Just like I pushed her and then I shoved her into the sand. 
There's something about her, though. She's got to know. (laughs) She's got to know I like her now. (laughs) Dang, nothing like normalizing fucking beating on people. Whatever. I mean, mean, another idea that I thought of. I mean, this is more connected to the idea of AI and whatnot. Is like the algorithms that we have in our like social medias and whatnot. How many times? I mean, I remember looking up one time. I looked up, you know, adapters for like a quarter inch cable for a uh, for a guitar. Or headphones or something like that. And then forever, I got more things that are related to, like, music production, <laughs> that are related to all of this stuff. So it's sort of, in a, in a way, it's like you're being programmed. I'm more sense. creeped out by, way. like, the accuracy of what they're recommending to you. So yeah. more than oh, them yeah. just listening to me. Because listening to me must be boring. Okay. <laughs> you know, like... But here's what I got to say. Have you ever thought, hey, you know what? I need to buy some deodorant. Go on your phone. Think about... Oh, de- you just think about it? Yeah. think about it. Well, yeah, because it's... Uh, you know, most of these algorithms function through machine learning networks or something like them. So you have a bunch of different variables that are going kind of face to face with one another right. in order to produce like a new synthesis of these variables. And so the reason that they're able to be so accurate most of the time isn't necessarily because they're listening to you. The government is, but generally not companies. They're just looking at all of your metadata and then selling it. Uh, but the, <laughs> Casual. The that, right? <laughs> the thing that happens with all this metadata is that they're able to make these extremely specific observations and actually know things uh, and desires of yours specifically before you do simply because of the fact that they acknowledge that a combination of these thousand different desires or facts about you imply that maybe – you're someone that could use a new stick of deodorant. Or we, yeah, we have also got like a bunch of patterns and we're repetitive right. and they'll know that you will come back to this at some point or something similar. So it's like just adjacent to it. And, and right. this goes back to the, this goes back to the, the yeah, whole, exactly. whole trauma thing of it, like, of it uh, being <laughs> pervasive. Smacking the microphone. Yeah, smack the microphone away. Get away, technology. I don't oh, need man. you. <laughs> Stop listening to me. Uh. Microphone. <laughs> um. <laughs> Suddenly becomes very phallic for you. You're like, oh, oh, oh. do you actually love the microphone? (laughs) (laughs) My, you're looking very slim and attractive today. So large, so black. All right. (laughs) Whoa. All right, I'm out. (laughs) Sorry, guys. (laughs) Well, it sheds some light as to why, like, most of our. most of our metaphors for masturbation are so violent. <laughs> for right? real. Yeah. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Choking the chickens. Beating <laughs> off. Beating, off. Beating my meat. <laughs> Beating my meat. Yeah. Uh, a and, wink. Right. And, and, and mo- mostly for men because yeah. people have a really kind of uh, bizarre, psychotic kind of break around women's sexuality. But – uh, yeah, and true. What women aren't sexual? What are you talking what? about? <laughs> well, they're, they're extremely sexual and not at all. Uh, <laughs> Only when they ride bicycles. Right. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I was reading about that today. Yeah, I love that so much. All right, um, I'm out again. <laughs> oh my god! Easily one of the funniest things you'll read because they're just like blown away by this thought. They're like, "What do you mean? What? Th- they can't possibly be enjoying bicycle right. riding. What the fuck? Mobility without connection to a man? Yeah. What is this? Oh. Whoa! Impossible." <laughs> Wait, I had a good one for masturbation. Handy- Too late. We're past it. What's Sorry. your point of view? What's your point of view? Handing out free literature. What? That's. Uh, did you just make that okay. up? No. <laughs> you just made that up. That's not a thing. Think about it, though. Handing out free literature. Here you go, sir. Here you go, sir. But that's assuming they read in the first place. Hey, no one does that. <laughs> How are you just going to assume they can read it all? Like, what? You're wow. handing out free literature. Listen it doesn't matter if they can read ableist. it. fucking ableist. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I totally derailed you. What were you saying? Yeah. Oh, that's just. It. Oh, you just wanted to talk <laughs> about just... masturbation. Okay. Well, gotcha. yeah, I just thought about it. <laughs> He's like, I just did. What do you mean? <laughs> sorry. In, in, in Murr's next porno, there's going to be just a person on the street. He's handing out books like, I got something else you can well, handle. <laughs> <laughs> Pulls out a fucking encyclopedia. <laughs> well, okay, fine. How... Get your hands on this. Here, here's the thing <laughs> it's all 25 bucks. So you want a porn of you for this? <laughs> It does bring up sexuality in the the audio log or article, I believe. But it also talks about how, like, machine AI, like, can be inherently sexual if the person programs it in. But they're mo- most certainly always going to do that. Oh, see, see that? Mo- what is the movie we just talked about? Ex Machina. Ex Machina, yeah. where he's yeah. like, yeah, you can fuck it. She might enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what I was th- Like, I was thinking about that when I was reading that. It's just... 
I don't know. Dorian right. could shed some light on that. Well, so. well, well even more than that, I mean, uh, subconscious biases do show up in algorithms all the time, which is why we have uh, things like racist and sexist algorithms, right? Uh, yeah. Even though it's yeah. not necessarily something that someone thinks about and says, well, I'm going to fucking make a racist computer. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I mean, I'm they sure, might. I'm sure yeah. someone has done that. Uh, a lot of people. Reddit is just actually a series of racist bots. So, nice. Yeah. Um, Fuck. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but but it's, it, it's, it's more that human beings are innately um, uh, biological, and so their biology wants to reproduce itself sexually or otherwise. And so anything that is produced or believed or thought by human beings has at least a roundabout connection to sexuality. And so the, uh, anything that we create, algorithms, machines, anything like that, is going to have that same sexual affect, especially when it comes to something that we want to improve on itself, like AI. So really what we're trying to say here is that we're all just trying to get laid on this podcast. <laughs> That's really the whole reason why we made this podcast, actually, is to... False. Uh, for the cookie. We did it all for the nookie and oh the cookie. Oh, my God. We went full circle back to Limp Bizkit. <laughs> what is this? Hey, don't speak for us all, okay? <laughs> <laughs> even worse than that, though. I got mine. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's not even just that. Oh, it's biology God. that wants to reproduce, reproduce itself, but that everything has this inbuilt uh, uh, tendency to want to do that. Um, and that this is something that, is, that displays per like Karen Smith in the way that, that clay uh, re-represents re itself in more and more complex crystal structurations. And so everything in the universe, the fact that we have a universe or physicality or minerals even up to animals and then all the way up into machines, which are actually kind of the, the other end, right? They're the inorganic returning from the organic that all of this stuff only ever intends to get closer to order, right? And so things as a response to entropy, which is, of course, a, a leading towards disorder, which ultimately, ironically, is the most absolute order because everything is totally flattened and non-existent, um, in, in process towards moving towards chaos necessarily has to reach through more and more uh, complex forms of order, which is why we have things like genes, right? And genes constantly fragment themselves and actually become more complicated, more ordered through fucking up, which is why we have human beings and human structures and society to begin with, is because we are actually representations of disorder, not necessarily order. And so that's where the eros and thanatos, as in the eros is in the erotic and the thanatos as in the, the drive towards inorganic, uh, the inorganic, like AI or rocks, um, <laughs> like dust to dust, right? Um, that's why all of these things are necessarily happening at the same time because Eros and Thanatos are the same function. And a, a mo motion towards order is the same thing as a motion towards chaos, and a motion towards chaos is the same thing as a motion towards order. And so the fact that we have an inbuilt uh, urge towards producing order, which we generally view as an impulse towards sexual gratification or, or, or completion or reproduction, it's, it's also connected to our own will towards death which things like algorithms also see and want to help us out with. <laughs> Yo, dog, I heard you like dying. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a few things. The, the French call it a little death for a reason. <laughs> oh, yeah. Then we're full circle to orgasms. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, when it, was, it was only going to take us so long before we got there. We started with masturbation. Now here we are at orgasms. Where's the suicide booth, baby? Yeah, oh. that's, that's fucking over now. It's done. I don't know. Ask Freud's ghost. But I mean, <laughs> but, I mean this comes... What a this, hack. I mean, this, this, like, I mean, I think I've already made this connection here, but I mean, this goes, this goes once again back to like the, the series of trauma idea that is, uh, that's Freudian in, in understanding, right? Am I right on that one? Okay, cool. Is it, wait, so I, I, I've been wondering, cause I don't really know myself. Has it been proven that most of his ideas were kind of like not fully substantiated or that he was like getting at something, but didn't really get all the way there? So every, every time that I speak to someone who studied psychology that makes that claim, I ask them which ones have been disproven and they Yeah, don't that's why I'm like. I'm not exactly sure where. About it. Uh, <laughs> the problem is that psychologists don't actually read psychoanalysis. Oh, geez, And so they yeah. don't yeah. know what's wrong to start with. Um, oh, but, but also, that makes sense. <laughs> that actually, that, yeah, yeah. That, that makes way more sense. Right. Uh, and I think a large part of that is a repressive reaction to read something like the Oedipus Complex yeah. and be like, 
I don't want to fuck my mom. <laughs> and so to like throw everything out, even though mm. that kind of that kind of structure, as Lacan picks up Freud later right. and describes, he describes it as being far more metaphorical than Freud's literal, I'm going to murder my fucking dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to panic because girls don't have peepees. And it's like, oh, it's not quite that. <laughs> Chill out. Um, by far, by the way, if anyone is interested in psychoanalysis or anything, the best person that you can read is not Freud, it's not Lacan, it's Bataille. Uh, and he's oh. also way cooler. <laughs> he's also way cooler. Yeah, like he talks that. about butts a lot. <laughs> I like him already. Yeah. <laughs> Is it the same as the anal fixation, or is it different? It's a big part of it. His, okay. his primary work is called, or one of his primary works is called the Solar Anus. <laughs> love it. <laughs> it's, it's so good. Yes. So good. Oh my god. I, I love having to tell people the titles of things in very like strong academia. They're like, I'm sorry, what was it called? <laughs> you're like, here, just it's like, did I stutter? Just read this. Just read this. <laughs> They're like, why do you want me to read your butt fiction? <laughs> Land, so Land did become like a parody of himself, and then, like I said, the oh, internet man. racist. But, oh, yeah, but yeah. One of his other useful works, because it's kind of half and half, uh, one of his other useful works it also has a hilarious name, and it's Can't Capital and the Prohibition of Incest. <laughs> and when you tell people, <laughs> oh, it's like, God. that's what I'm reading, it doesn't get better when you explain what it's about, because people ask <laughs> you, like, well, what's going on? And he's like, well, he's saying that women need to start, like, a violent revolution and kill all the men. Uh, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> <laughs> bet. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. Let me, like, uh, he's got this cool quote in here. It's, uh, any war against the metropolitan state uh, n only needs to be fought in hell. Uh, I don't know what he's saying. Really. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Woo! Goddamn. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not exactly clear. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty metal. So I mean, does it need to be said how this piece connects to the horror genre? Have we explained that? Uh, we've well we've talked about it uh, in the sense of like it's able to get certain thoughts into your head while your guard is down, which is usually the like the thing that some people are trying to do with certain pieces of media. Not mm -hmm. necessarily like propaganda, but there might be some pieces where they want you to feel a certain way, and so that becomes an idea or something that they plan whenever they're making it. And so that's actually like a thing that people do in filmmaking is that a part of their plan may include I want you to feel this and I want you to understand this certain idea and so that's where it sort of ties into what we're talking about most of the time is that it's giving an emotion to most people and horror films usually deal with people um dealing with the problem on a larger scale so what society might be dealing with at that time there might be horror films made for it and if you go back like and research things there's like certain time periods where people really like vampire films people really yeah. like w like werewolf films people really like certain types of films at certain times like the what is it the um the post-apocalyptic ones where there's like a giant storm or something there was like four of those movies within yeah. like the same year because we were all just thinking about it and stressed about it so that's what i end up thinking about so it makes sense that this would be sort of like the more in-depth version of it as, as far as literature goes right i feel like that's kind of a premise of all art is that it comes from some sort of emotional uh provocation things like uh, how you're talking about certain movie genres. I was just thinking about the whole like aliens thing that was really big in like the 60s yep. and 70s. And we had a lot of fear of international invaders coming yep. to our country. All of the immigrants that people were terrified of. And even it shows though up that's, like, across it was. all forms. It comes across music. It comes across movies, uh, physical art, like paintings and whatnot, literature. It's also a sneaky way for artists to get you to think about something that you wouldn't normally think about. As far as like say some racist people might end up being okay with people coming into their lives if they think of it as an alien as opposed to like oh look at this black person right. coming into your life and like, AKA, in a like way, star trek when you put things in a more abstract form i feel like it's easier for people to understand yeah oh e either easier or they're more able to absorb it and, and they're not feeling confronted in some way because <laughs> right. that's always the thought of just right. like what no i'm not wrong <laughs> Because not everybody wants to listen to straight up facts, but you yeah, give them exactly. some sort of image or storyline to follow, and it's a lot easier to embody. This is true. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> which is why I, you know, I get really frustrated with the like the Harry Potter liberal. A lot of the time. <laughs> yeah. It's just like extremely exhausting. Um, but theoretically, I mean, I, I don't know. This is this is an interesting debate that maybe should have happened. But is Harry Potter something that uh, causes? Uh, shit libs to become more shit libby or is it something that allows them to progress deeper into you know leftism and become cool ass socialists 
uh, or, or something like that. Or something. Uh, or something. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what everyone's politics it's... is here, but I'm so used to just... <laughs> I don't even oh, know yeah. at it's this point. Insane anarcho It's a weird ass. place to start for people who want to discuss sort of like the leftist politics because it ends up being this idea or this world that you're building off of that's already segregated to begin with. Yes. So you're just like, not only do they already have people who are magical and people who are not and go as far as to like start degrading them at some point, mm. but also there's like the class system within the wizards who are are like rich and poor so it's like that's kind of a bad place to start anyway yeah actually yeah i, I think we answered our, the, the question there where, where yeah. harry potter actually is just a really gross like center right liberal kind of yeah space. exactly especially because you have like you have the magical wunderkind like yeah exactly really, nothing would change in harry potter if you just replaced him with Buttigieg. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> <laughs> I like oh, that response he, block. He'd be gay. He'd be gay. That's the only that, thing. I was going to say, no, no, he would be gay. <laughs> no, one, no, one would, no one would spend, I don't know, 37 books like oh, hoping man. that he fucks Hermione. That's great. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I might have, but whatever. <laughs> man, was he I does. disappointed. Why'd, he go, why'd she go with Ron? Uh, oh, man. I mean, I guess why? <laughs> these Harry Potter individuals that you're talking about. I think I've seen these creatures before. Uh, I drive behind them. They hang out with the Doctor Who people. Anyway. Oh, no. Whoa, hey, don't come for Doctor I Who. Guess, uh, you guys are going to get some of that hate mail now. Yeah, right? I hope That's so. Dope. That's cool. Yeah. Bring you're it welcome. on. <laughs> I, you're welcome. I, I guess now I shouldn't bring up. I'm rewatching it. <laughs> <laughs> Which season, though? What, what? Well, I stopped watching it in 2015, and so I'm catching up to get to the current female doctor because okay. I want to see that. Makes sense. I want to see that. I thought, I thought fair. you started Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, I did too for a second. I was like, so how has your Harry Potter watching affected your politics, Mark? <laughs> Fun fact. I've only seen one Harry Potter movie. It was the last part of the last one. Everybody dies. It's sick. <laughs> sick. Just like at the end of liberalism. Oh, yeah. dang. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, no. uh, it's, it's called Love Gun, and the gun is his dick. <laughs> well, Fuck I, off. Fine cinema. <laughs> That's uh, right. That's one of the good movies we discussed like, on here. Listen, we've watched Blue Velvet. We understand. <laughs> uh, don't get me started. wholesome way to connect uh this to horror in the end is to uh give value to the horror genre right right which is that the the reason that people are attracted to something like horror um is kind of it's it's twofold right where either it's people uh who had uh kind of limited experiences in their upbringing and they are experiencing the world through that because the world is in some way ineffable and they get to gather it up by seeing things of, of this extremity or they're people with that repetition compulsion kind of issue where there were problems uh in their their upbringing or even you, you know, later as well where there are traumas and feelings of extremity that haven't found a home yet and so by experiencing these uh, horrible things, it actually can be kind of a healing experience. And it doesn't have to be an intellectualized healing experience either. It can just be, ah, oh, shit, that was awesome. Because your, your aesthetic taste and your bodily responses are, and your intellect are all part of the same machine, right? So by enjoying something aesthetically or just by thinking it's fun and cool that is still an intellectual kind of experience and it is still a bodily experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's why they have such a strong fan base for people who watch horror films. Cause well, it has a specific aesthetic. Yeah. <laughs> There's like an aesthetic that you can kind of get into that will extend beyond just watching the film. And it's why people love slasher films so much. Cause they create these icons for you where, you know, like the rules of what you're going to get into. Rules are, rules are huge. I was talking about this. I, I, I did a live uh, like last week and, and had a long talk about this, but, rules in horror were so important to me when i was a kid extremely <laughs> yeah. important which is why i was a like a vampire nerd when i was like an <laughs> elementary school kid yes. ah yes because the vampire phase such <laughs> yes. such such like simplified or not even right. simplified but but explicit rules right they can't even walk into your house without being invited yeah like, exactly and then watching people break those rules in other forms of media yep. really like bugged me as i was growing up i'm like silver that's <laughs> a werewolf thing and shit like that but uh there's always yeah. changing rules too and whenever exactly. people bend them slightly sometimes people are uncomfortable but then sometimes you're like oh that's 
pretty fucking dope. I like the way that's go- exactly. where that's going. Yeah. Like the sparkling vampires in Twilight. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can, can, I, can I ask a question? Of everyone, yeah. Actually? Yes. Um, I'm sure you guys have already covered this, but uh, what's your favorite slasher? I like Hellraiser. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, we can psychoanalyze using slasher movies here. <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> Wait, why Hellraiser? I don't. I, I like the idea of like trans-dimensional beings coming through and just fucking everything oh, that's up for fair. funsies. That's actually really cool. <laughs> that's just what they do. Nice. <laughs> is Candyman a slasher? Hell yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, it's I, deeply political. Yeah, that yeah. one is a great one. Yeah. I, I just really like everything about it. I can't find a bad thing. Even the soundtrack by Philip Glass, fucking stellar. Yeah. <laughs> Love it's, it's Philip Glass. That, yeah, that Philip Glass did a fucking slasher movie. Yeah, it's wild. <laughs> it's that movie does not get the i mean it gets a lot of credit in horror circles but it outside of it does not get any of the credit yeah, it deserves it's, it's true phenomenal um, fucking the thing dude is it a slasher it, kinda. kinda it's a oh. thing that like fills oh. no not really not really am i misgenreizing if, something if we're counting hellraiser maybe we can count the thing but i would still say maybe something else i don't know something cuz it's more wanting to just count. eat everyone it isn't like it isn't like a, it's following any kind of... Well, it does follow some rules. You know what? No, no, no. I got a different one. Black Christmas. Okay. Oh, okay. Wow. The guy from Black OG, Christmas. OG Black Christmas. Okay. There we go. That's fair. Uh, Freddy Krueger is always going to be my favorite because it's hilarious to me that he taunts people and can go into their dreams and do whatever the fuck he wants. But it's just like he always makes it a comical thing. And I feel like if you're going to be completely deranged, then that's the way you're going to do it as a killer. You're going to be like taunting them the whole time and then it gets very violent. <laughs> Mine's definitely Halloween. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ah, yes. 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 Yeah, Michael because, Myers. Because it has nothing to do with motive. Yeah. It's it, it all, all the movie is is that a bad thing happens. There's no reason for it to happen. They give a reason later, but yeah. fuck off. Uh, <laughs> it, it those happens. movies don't exist. Right. <laughs> they skip those. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> they were like, no, forget like the eight movies that were made. We're going right to the second one. He's still alive. And, and it, he also has no intention of making up a reason. Right. You know, he, all he does is slowly get towards you and then accomplish the goal. He's right. Just, just yeah, never yeah. runs at you. Uh, <laughs> I... I think so. I've known Mitch for quite a few years, right? I I, I think I, I know you best out of anyone here, uh, yeah, that makes or, sense. or or I know you better than I know the other people is what I meant. Um, but so guessing why you like Black Christmas the most probably has to do with disruption in family environment and the fact that you want to take uh, <laughs> take something as hallowed as Christmas and then uh, kind of reintegrated into your life as something that doesn't require it's viewed in a hallowed way <laughs> but also uh, necessarily considering the notion that there is a deep sexual undercurrent that inside of the movie itself is not taken entirely seriously which allows you to continue processing a lot of early sexual urges along with this uh, kind of complex uh, figuration of capital that you're talking about. <laughs> yes. Oh yes. my god. Yo, Woo. Mitch just had a whole existential he, experience. He backed right away now. from the mic. My parents got divorced when I was in uh, <laughs> fifth grade, fourth grade. So that might be something. It's also a movie that my mom is really frightened of. Oh, yeah. So I kind of, I guess I sort of take pride in being like, I really enjoy that movie. My mom's like, I will not fucking watch that movie <laughs> at all. That movie, the, 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 the rocking chair with the cellophane on the face. No, I won't do it. Won't fucking do it. <laughs> Fuck me up. I really just like that movie because I just thought it was a really good concept for a movie. And there's right. nothing exactly like it. You know what I mean? Like, like the creepy voice on the telephone. The fact that like how the movie does its opening and closing action, which I've explained before. Where like the kill, you never actually see the killer except for like one silhouette for a moment. Right, and and that's, that's true. your conscious understanding of it. Yeah, exactly. But apparently, on my subconscious is that I have a deep, weird sexual thing in the. You know, I didn't get laid a lot in high school either. <laughs> so like, you know, that might be a, a thing as well. I might just be really upset that I never got laid by oh all these God, sorority that's girls. Hilarious. There were sorority girls in high school. <laughs> Better Ooh. question. Better question. Yeah. Just hanging out outside. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's metaphorical, Justine. The okay. metaphorical <laughs> Did you mean the cheerleaders? The cheerleaders actually uh, always yes. ignored me. Because um, nobody likes the cheerleaders. Everybody likes the dance team. Anyway. Actually, it depends what school you go to. Because everyone thought the dance team at my school were sluts. And they were, but like, whatever. I mean, they were. <laughs> <laughs> they were, but whatever. You know what? I love that. I don't care what you say. The coolest guy at my school was the guy who was listening to anime music and dancing in the quad with his headphones in. 
cat ears? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. Only on, only on certain days. Oh. Only on certain days. See, those were my friends in high school. Nice. Just like, what do you listen to? K-pop? Just fucking dance. Bro, but starts K-pop ki- goes starts hard. Starts hitting it. <laughs> oh, look at the hug here. Uh, oh, man. Would you like to sit down, son? No, that was good. Yeah, that, that was, was good, good yeah. But, I mean, but did we hear Murr's favorite slasher, though? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's Candyman. Yeah, it's oh, Candyman. Candyman. That's a good movie. I do have another favorite, though. I also like Ghostface from Scream. Because he's just so fucking useless sometimes and gets beat the fuck up in like most of the movies. So it's like he's he's a like a normal, defeatable person, but it's still like he's still really dangerous. Now, <laughs> so you're just like, what the fuck is he doing half the time? Now you brought up rules. One of the best scenes in that movie is the guy explaining the rules yeah. of horror movies right. in a horror movie. Yes. Just like you can't have sex. Boo! <laughs> <laughs> Points to Wes Craven for that. <laughs> That was a good one. It was a great way to take apart his own genre and be like, look, it's actually pretty silly, but we're still going to do it because you guys like violence and sex. And that's what they did. <laughs> that's why those movies are so popular. Well, at least the first one was the second. So why do, you, why do you – okay. So there's these base horror movies that everyone knows, everyone likes to grow up with. Where do you stand on the grindhouse subgenre? Because that is a whole other thing. You got child murder. You got sometimes a lot of rape. Yeah, it's all the things you're it's like not you supposed to do see. in film. So like, yeah. how do you feel about, you know, people who like Grindhouse films or like the subculture of Grindhouse itself? I think it's dope. Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so a, a, a big part of, of thinkers like Bataille is this interest in limit experience or transgression because ultimately his view and my view of the kind of motor behind all of psychology, society, uh, all physical laws, anything like that, is always uh, in in seeking of an exceedance. So when there's too much of something, there's enough of it, kind of thing. And so I think that things like grindhouse films um, are, you know, deeply troubling uh, and make it funny oftentimes. Uh, for a very good social reason and that we need these transgressive and uh, and exceeding kind of pieces of media, especially if there's something that uh, can exist as non-habitual like that, right? Where, yeah, there are people that are huge fans of Grindhouse Cinema and stuff, but uh, Grindhouse Cinema never really ruins your life uh, versus other forms of uh, uh, kind of habitual transgressive release uh, which I'm sure we can think of a few of them. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think those are awesome, but also just the the, the notion, and I, I wanted to bring it up before, uh, but that any any attempt to producing a genuinely liberatory uh, movement for anyone necessarily engages with the uh, elimination of taboo and repression, right? And so the more we accept the aesthetic enjoyment of things that are wrong, the closer we get to an actually like equal and decent society, I think. So yeah, Grand House is cool. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of makes me think about like video games in particular, yes. since we're talking about technology and AI and cyberspace and all that good stuff is a lot of people really like violent video games, things like Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty, all shooter games, you know, you're killing people all the time. And in a way, I feel like a lot of people have these sort of violent tendencies that they can't act out on because culturally it's taboo to just go around and killing people. So (laughs) rather than doing it in real life, you act it out through a virtual space where there really are no limits and no rules to what you can do. Could be why people like slasher films as well and they will laugh when someone gets killed. Because you get to live (laughs) vicariously through these things that you might not ever be able to experience in your waking (laughs) life. But in a way, it's sort of programmed, I feel like, in part of human nature is to be destructive and be violent. There's there's actually ancient Greek scholarship on this um, where... The reason that you have stories like uh, Antigone or Oedipus or anything like that is, um, I mean, Sophocles makes this argument as well as a lot of the actual scholars that were commenting on his work at the time and after that these pieces of art exist as catharsis. They're a release because otherwise, uh, number one, you'll be tempted to perform a lot of these actions just because you have an impulse to uh, or uh, simply because of the fact that experiencing pain allows you to uh, have a release of other forms of pain in your life. Right. Uh, So this makes me think of like historically how, you know, people have been killing each other forever and it's definitely become less of a common thing nowadays. I mean, still pretty common, but (laughs) I think a lot of that has to do with now that we have access to film 
things like that. We can experience these things without actually doing them ourselves. Oh, yeah. There's been a huge uh, debate and argument that's come up on whether or not they should allow this media to exist because it might curb some people from actually doing the real thing. But also the very existence of it kind of uh, is like an affront to some people because they're like, why are you allowing this to happen? Such as like games that include things that are like pedophilic or rape or anything like that. This... Where people will say it should be there because somebody should have like an open world like that. But it's also like, do you really want to have something like that? And someone has to make it in the first place. That's that's why I think that literature continues to exist as like a fantastic space for right. um, uh, transgressive activity. Because, yeah, I don't know how much I really want to read about like like Lolita was difficult to get through. Oh, geez, like that. Yeah. Jeez. Um, I read and... that in high school. Oh, <laughs> but... Why did they give that to us in high school? <laughs> But, but, but I think that's so much more, uh, I mean, it's so much easier to justify, right. obviously, than, uh, than even, like, the moderate version of these. I, 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 by moderate, I mean, like, the extreme being actual child porn Right, or yeah. Uh, but the moderate being some, like, kind of depiction of a video game, which I think that has some complications. Uh, and maybe I'm just, uh, I have hang-ups around kids uh having sex i think it's it's not a cool thing oh so yeah i, I want to avoid i also don't think murder is a cool thing but i'm uncomfortable <laughs> with it but so i don't know no i don't know if it's because uh if i'm inventing complications in my head simply because of the fact that it's uncomfortable for me which i try not to do because my whole like my whole project is about excess and like transgression and stuff but or if there's a logical reason i'm trying to think of what those might be but, uh, I mean, I have similar time. feelings about people putting rapes into film. I feel like if you put rape into your film, then it's weak writing. That like you could find other things that will shock people instead of just using that because people right. already know how it can shock people. So it's like, why would you go down the same route? Yeah. Of like showing something that we've seen before. Also, it's like a weird way to show like a power dynamic that doesn't need to exist there. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember having an argument with you about this, actually, uh, on the internet once. Uh, but, <laughs> ah, yeah. the internet. I do not remember this. <laughs> I mean, hopefully... He's always fighting with people. It's okay. Yeah, same. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that, generally speaking, the way that uh, rape and sexual abuse and stuff like that, it, that is used in media is generally very weak, but I, I find it difficult to say that you just, like, something is is off limits for writing but yeah generally speaking it is used as kind of a oh i don't know what the fuck else to put in here on and be shocking yeah yeah so exactly yeah. yeah definitely there was a game that we just reviewed uh called cyberpunk okay. you've obviously heard of it um it's a very <laughs> obscure it's video it's game named after me <laughs> <laughs> well within the game they have a thing called the brain dance right okay. and, ah, the brain and dance. i think this would be a, a cool thing for you to talk about um Basically, it's like a wreath you put over your head, and you get to relive uh, someone's experience. And you could there's a black market for these things, right? So like they have some where they fuck things. They have stuff some where it's actual murder, yeah, brutal. And murders. they're just like recordings that people they could feel it all, and like they feel the like the exhilaration, the sweat. And when they come out, they're like, "Damn, that was a good one. I need to buy a fucking another." Yeah. They're... So like they live in this excess, like you were talking yeah. about, but like they could just get it off the street. Why kill someone when you could just get it downloaded straight to your head? Yeah, I, I, I think that's I think that's great, and I think that there are certainly like obvious connections in in, in a lot of ways, but maybe um, a, a more bizarro take um, would be that another another piece of the text actually, which is he he brings up deterritorialization a lot, which is kind of a buzzword in like Deleuze and philosophy circles. I mean, necessarily Deleuze circles or Guattari circles because he's the person that came up with it. But uh, what deterritorialization is is it's essentially the decoding or the stripping away of meanings and implications and stuff like that of, uh, uh, of objects, right? And uh, capital is the ultimate deterritorializing machine. And what I mean by that is that the, the very purpose of capital is to, oh, there's a cat rubbing against the, the stand, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, its whole purpose is to make it so that if you have a goat and I have a book, um, that exchange becomes very difficult. Uh, but if we decide that there's a mediating force between the two of them that strips away and de deterritorializes the meanings, um, all of these things can be traded. Uh, so, right. you, so your book teaches me how to grow corn, right? Maybe. Well, hopefully. I mean, it, <laughs> that's, a, that's who, the thing. Who knows? Right? I mean, what, you mean you don't know how to grow corn? May, maybe my book uh, is just pictures of cats. No, it's yeah, a guide on how to fuck but, your goat. 
<laughs> what, what, what money does is it allows for exchange of everything. And so money is the space where all, everything exists, but nothing exists as what it is, right? Everything's meaning is stripped away. And so this, this happens because capitalism always wants to grow and it always wants to consume, right? Uh, and so it doesn't keep anything hallowed. Uh, and it, it does this same thing to culture and to other meanings. And so deterritorialization is this ongoing process uh, of, of stripping away a meaning and giving a new meaning to something else. It also happens to people, right? In as like horrifying a way as something like the transatlantic slave trade is one notion of the deterritorialization, re-territorialization of a literal human being, but this also occurs with identities and thoughts and needs and wants, right? And the kids, the kids on a microphone now. <laughs> 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 and, and so um, that is really interesting to me because it, it becomes, uh, in cyberpunk, a literal marketplace right. of deterritorializing and re-territorializing as different people. And yeah. that you become others. The thing that's really interesting to me is that you said it's literally other people's experiences. Yeah, they so were, these are real things that happen. These yes. are real things that happen. Yes, and, and that's really they were recorded yeah. and then resold later. There's so, also the other aspect of uh, certain um, people who do sex work who have uh, implants put in, uh, the where doll they end up chip. being yeah, where they end up being dolls, and their body goes through the experience, but they don't remember it. It's like being in a. Yeah. Kind of like a psychosis. Thing. Yeah, it's that that one was like that one really got me where I was just like, oh, you don't even remember what happened to you, and it could and be like something terrible. When you get into a certain point in the game, you can program the chip for other things besides right. just sex work. You could also do mercenary. Work. Yeah, you can just <laughs> go and murder someone, and you wouldn't know. And then like, how do you deal with that? As far as like, are you actually uh, what's the word accountable for something like that? Right, right, and and that's that enters. I mean. First off, it enters into questions of ethics, like with uh, self-driving cars. And stuff right. Like that. Like, yeah. Who's accountable? Yeah. It's the program. Yeah. If it hits something. <laughs> um, but also, you know, capital. What it necessarily wants from you. Sorry, guys. It, no matter every. It, no matter what happens, every time I open my mouth, I'm gonna bitch about capital. Like it just. <laughs> it's, it's who I am. It's what I do. Uh, but capital. All it does is is request or demand that you right. sell your body. Yeah. Right. Uh, in any kind of state, which is also why it's so uh, funny and bizarre that people are so, like, uh, you know, anxious about sex work. Uh, oh, right, yeah. <laughs> but, because literally everyone's job is that. But one th one phenomenon yep. that I think is really, really fascinating is that there are so many of these, like, uh, Silicon Valley people who I will shit on until I die. Uh, <laughs> but that they are, uh, they're seeking flow states. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And a flow state is essentially when you forget what you're doing and continue to act. Yeah, that's right? that's kind of a weird. And I so, experience that a lot when I'm making art. It makes right. sense though yeah. for yeah. what you're and, doing. And, so. yeah. and it's great. Yeah. But the fact is that they're they're trying to induce flow states with production of capital because honestly, I would love to be in a flow state whenever I'm at work because it means that I'm not experiencing it. But that also means that there is even more of you that is capitalized and sold off. Uh, I mean, you 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 don't um, you don't have to experience that. Uh, that consciously uh, mitigated trauma, but that's another interesting psychoanalytic question: is whether or not what you experience in a flow state is still experienced in the subconscious and rises up to haunt you later. Whether or not that induces repetition <laughs> compulsion. Yeah. And so it, that would be a fun thing for a spinoff of that video game because this is this is, does come from a tabletop game, right? And right. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It does. Yeah. So if anyone runs a cyberpunk tabletop game, here's my here's my request for you or my offer. Uh, have a game w for your players where all that happens is that the memories that they don't have start p bubbling back up in their minds and uh, they have to find some way to solve all those issues. Uh, the, this kind of uh, repeating trauma of being a mercenary or a prostitute or whatever. I'm currently making a campaign. Well, so it's his now. No one else you. is allowed to have it. <laughs> <laughs> have fun with that. Fuck. There you go. I got to get back to the yeah, writing board. Have fun with that. Uh, so, so without even blinking, we've already reached an hour. Oh. <laughs> that was that was Flow state. that was a lot, and when, which is awesome. Uh, I was I think I was skeptical at first because I wasn't sure how some of the things were going to connect, and then they became connected. Uh, and I'm guessing because you, you I mean you talk about this stuff pretty constantly. And w what is your workshop exactly about? Ah, uh, smooth segue into the uh, <laughs> into the pitch. Yeah, so uh, I run a writing and uh, theory workshop. Okay. Uh, we have formal events that happen every Saturday, 11 to uh, 2 p.m. PST. 
Uh, and in that, we talk about theory for an hour or two. We do some exercises, and then we go over people's writing. Usually it's poetry, but we've also looked at short stories. We've looked at piece of people's uh, academic work, bits of theory, pretty much anything you want to uh, bring up to us. We do even the paintings. We do pretty much everything. But uh, And then on Thursdays, we do informal meetups where for three hours from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., people pop in and out, and we just talk about anything you want. Uh, and, and we do that. So you can find all this stuff uh, on Patreon. It's Truncata, T-R-U-N-C-A-T-A, or you can find it in my bio uh, where I have a nightmarish uh, uh, <laughs> philosophy and art meme page <laughs> called Dank great. Deleuze, D-A-N-K-D-E-L-E-U-Z-E, -E -E. and then the, uh, the Patreon link is in the bio. Um, that's my pitch. Yeah, it, it makes sense because as you were going through all of it, you do explain things very well. So once you were able to go through and explain it, and I wasn't just reading one of the articles, like, okay, I'm like, that actually has a lot more connections to what we were discussing. So it was fun. Awesome. <laughs> one, one thing I learned today was that I know what Eros means now. So now all the Eros means make a lot more sense, and they're very funny. <laughs> there's Eros, like Eros everywhere. There's a whole blank like, spot yeah. of memes of just like, yes, what does it mean? Yeah, they, they, what does it mean? Anyway, uh, but... <laughs> I'm such a dad. I'm just going to pun all the time when I can. You know. yeah. One of the upcoming uh, uh, workshops that we're doing is actually going to be focusing on Eros and nice. eroticism. So uh, if, uh, if any of you folks... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch. Yeah, I'll, so I'll walk in there and discuss... Uh, I'll write some erotic fiction for the... Uh, for the thing I'll have. Go read some Chuck Tingle. Yeah, yeah. We'll oh, some no. Chuck Tingle stories. Hell yeah. Let's Side get some, note, get, can we please do a yes. Chuck Tingle reading episode? We really should. We really Bro, should. we need to buy one of his books. Yeah, we gotta, oh we gotta buy a few of his books. Well, and Jordan, just are you familiar with this man? Yeah. I, oh, good. I, I, I am familiar, and I'm going to make an offer to you guys right now. Yes. Because I, we do have a full studio space that I work in, because oh, I damn. also have a podcast. Nice. Which is Benzo Rehab Dungeon. Yes. Uh, which it. mostly we talk about politics, a little bit of theory, but usually not that dense. We mostly talk about how much we hate Trump or Biden now. Uh, <laughs> uh, Fuck honestly, central powers, honestly. Yeah, 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 I yeah. mean, we, mostly we've always bitched about Biden. That's really, uh, that's who, who we dislike, I guess. Pelosi is mostly, anyway, it doesn't matter. We complain about everyone. <laughs> uh, and we talk a little bit about theory, uh, and we are uh, humorous uh, chaps, but... Um, uh, yeah, because we have that studio, I can t record some Chuck Tingle and send it to you guys. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. please, please do that. <laughs> so I'll do that, and in return, I will ask people to check out my podcast as yes. well. Benzo Rehab Dungeon. Uh, that's on Spotify. That's everywhere. Uh, we have it on YouTube now, but I don't know why you'd want to see my face. Uh, <laughs> and you can also find my co-host. I'm actually his co-host. He's the he's he's my daddy. Uh, but that's Benzo Rehab Dungeon on Instagram. Is this some Freudian dynamic going on here? Oh yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> then that we've we've reached the end. Do you want to wrap it up, Mitch? I'm really sad that this is over because I was really enjoying this whole conversation. <laughs> I have so many more things I need we're, to say. We're going to have to like episode. This is, we'll have a part two. Yeah, we're going to have to keep it going and then formulate some questions not, not as well. Not even. I will. I, we shouldn't lie to them. That we will, we should legitimately do a part two. I think. Oh yeah, no, yeah, we will. So I said it. I <laughs> said it, didn't I? I? Yeah, you did. You did. But you know, we've said a lot of things on here. Like you what, have. what have we said on here that well, we've not done yet? All of them, John. Then you are lying. <laughs> <laughs> Liar. Where are the shit. receipts? Me and my my disjointed family past, <laughs> my sexual repression. God, it's so real. <laughs> Damn, what a way to outro, Mitch. <laughs> I know. <laughs> anyway, so that with that depressing thought in mind, just He's like, like nothing Nick really Lamb's matters, you're all gonna die anyway. Let's accelerate. In the end. Uh, that concludes this podcast for the <laughs> evening. As you know, you can find us on all of the major streaming services. Spotify, SoundCloud, and the other ones. You know them. As well as, we also have a Teespring up, so if you guys want a t-shirt from us and whatnot, you can go on there and find the uh, Bringing Down the Grindhouse uh, <sighs> storefronts. Everyone's <laughs> dancing and I'm distracted, but it's okay. Keep dancing, you know. Um... <laughs> Uh, also, we'd like to do a, a shout out to Sean. He's our been our monthly patron. Sean, Sean, what up, dude? He's our he's our he's our yeehaw fan. <laughs> he's from <laughs> Texas, so we call him the yeehaw fan. Yeah, he's our, yeah, he's from Texas. The yeehaw fan, you know. <laughs> yeah, yes. keep, yeah, please. Uh, I'm getting them set up, believe me. <laughs> um, but anyway, I think 
that's the scoop. Merch. That's all you need to know. Send us more hate merch. Mail. And the, yeah, get more merch. We have a Patreon. Buy our t-shirts. Buy our t-shirts. Buy our t-shirts. Send us capital. Harry Potter sucks. Anyway. <laughs> Harry, Potter, <laughs> Harry Potter is big lame. <laughs> Remind them all how beautiful I am and how much you love me being on the podcast so that you actually do bring me back. Thank you. Yeah. It, you know, it was so nice of Dorian it's to, you know, true. make his whole way down here in my car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. In my passenger seat. <laughs> in, in my car, oh my uh, like I just said. Um I got a laugh, but uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was really great having you on. Um, thank you so much for coming out and uh, being willing to discuss all this Woo! and just honestly yeah. being a being a little teacher for us. And yeah, some it's really true. like very very uh, difficult to read text. I feel enlightened. <laughs> uh, with that, I'm Mitch. I'm Mur. I'm Justine. I'm Jonathan. I'm Dank Deluxe on Instagram.com. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys. Good night. <laughs>